coming in. Yeah, flex. I just wanna win. Yeah, L.A. BB, who we running with? Yeah, two, two, three, three. I'm on ten again. Hey guys, welcome to my podcast. I'm Elo Speaks, and on my podcast, we talk about everything that's going on in the sports right now, regarding the latest trending topics in the sports world. I have a great fun conversation talking about basketball, football, MMA, boxing, etc. I give my perspective and opinions on the sports topics that interest me, whether it's by me by myself, talking with guest appearances, debating, arguing, or disagreeing, or during reaction videos. We are here to have a fun dialogue and talk about the sports that we love to watch. Make sure to follow me on Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and Twitch to get updates with my latest podcast when I drop. Stay tuned. Thank you and enjoy. Hey, what's up, guys? This is Elo Speaks back again with another video. Back with another Elo Speaks podcast, episode 6. And in this episode, I want to talk about a myriad of things. You already know what it is. NFL, NBA, UFC, just sports in general. Things that I love to talk about. The first thing we're going to get into it right now is the NFL Super Bowl. So, as you know, the Los Angeles Rams has won the Super Bowl. They beat the Cincinnati Rams 23-20. to It was a great game. I had fun watching it. I enjoyed the halftime show. It was a great performance. Everything. One thing I wanted to talk about as regards to the Super Bowl was the performance of play of it. I see that in the Super Bowl, the Los Angeles Rams had Cooper Cup, and that was the main difference in the game. Cooper Cup was amazing. He had a great stat line. He had eight receptions, 92 yards, averaging 11.5 receptions per catch, and he had two touchdowns. People were flaming Eli Apple for covering him. Rightfully so, he deserved it. He was talking a lot of trash before the Super Bowl, trolling. Kansas City Chiefs players after the Bengals that beat them and doing a lot of talking saying he wanted to guard uh, Odell Beckham Jr. Odell Beckham Jr. had a decent game too. He had two receptions, 52 yards, and a touchdown early in the game. And then he went out with a, a knee injury, I think he tore his ACL. Um, I hope a speed recovery for him. Congratulations on him winning his title. And then I also wanted to talk about, you know, the Cincinnati Bengals and their play. Now, Cincinnati Bengals were up on the on the game. They were winning. It's just the poor protection on Joe Burrow. It was sad to see. Cause Joe Burrow, I like Joe Burrow. He's a great young man. He has a future. If they could give him some protection for the long haul, he's gonna be a great quarterback moving forward. I think he's gonna be one of the best quarterbacks of this decade. It's a shame that they wasn't able to get protection from him. He's been getting sacked all this whole playoff series, and still he was able to make it to the Super Super Bowl despite that poor offensive line and like do what he had to do. Granted, he had a lot of great help with him, like with Jamar Chase, Joe Mixon, and etc. But if he just had time in the pocket and better pass protection, then that would have went a long way and possibly helped him win the Super Bowl. But I don't want to take nothing away from the. Los Angeles Rams because they were star-studded on that team with Aaron Donald, Vaughn Miller, Matthew Stafford, OBJ, Cooper Cup, etc., etc. They were just on it and they were they were chasing that title and they wanted it wanted it way more than the Bengals did. So they ended up winning. So again, congratulations to them and all they what they had to do. It was an amazing performance by the Los Angeles Rams, especially being at home. This is the second team in NFL history to win a Super Bowl at home. And coincidentally, the first team to do it was the Tampa Bay Buccaneers who won their Super Bowl at home last year. So it's back to back years. So the next Super Bowl in 2023 is Glendale, Arizona. So who knows Will the Arizona Cardinals might make a playoff run. Who knows? So that's what I want. That's what I want to get into. As regards to that, because it's looking a little fishy right now, as regards to that. Uh, so, Cooper Cup won the uh, NFL Super Bowl MVP, right for the reserve. He was a game 
breaker. He made the difference in the game. He scored the game winning touchdown for them, which put them up. And then the Bengals did have a, did have an opportunity to win the game, but Aaron Donald would not be denied. He was causing havoc all over the field. He was causing mismatch problems. They were trying to double team him and still wasn't enough. And he made the game winning play where he made a, a QB hurry, which made, he almost got a sack, but he made a, a QB hurry, which made Joe Burrow didn't have time to properly throw the ball and basically end the game on the fourth and one. So congratulations to him. He earned it. He's one of the, he's the best defensive player in the league right now. Is I could, I could honestly say that with a shadow of a doubt. He's one of the best defensive players in the league. He cannot be stopped. He needs to be double team, possibly triple team. And then we get Von Miller on the edge, also causing havoc. That's going to be a problem for a lot of quarterbacks. So that's just how it was. And he made the play to win the game, and he basically sealed the deal, saying, put that ring on my finger. And he will be getting a ring. And everybody in the Los Angeles Rams team will be getting a championship ring. ring with Jaina Ramsey, all of them, etc. And I know LA is very excited right now that, you know, Los Angeles Rams won a title. They're going to be celebrating throughout the city because they just won a Super Bowl. So congratulations to the city of Los Angeles and all over whoever is a Rams fan out there. As for the Bengals. Uh, I hope this I hope this is a lesson for them. Um, will they be able to get back to the Super Bowl? Probably. Probably. I do see a bright future for Joe Burrow. But they got to go into the draft, free agency, however they can, address that offensive line play, up, upgrade his blockers, and see what they can do about that. And they need to upgrade the defense as well. But... If, I feel like if Joe Burrow had a little bit better protection, that would went a long way from him being sacked seven times in the Super Bowl to making key plays that he could have made if he had just a little bit more protection. Because we already know we already know this though. Because this started all the way from the first round, divisional rounds, with the Tennessee Titans where he got sacked nine times. And then fast forward to all the way to the Super Bowl, he gets sacked seven times in the Super Bowl. So, and then one of the sacks he got, he almost twisted his ankle, his knee. So he almost got injured there. So it's a little fortunate, but it is what it is. The NFL, the best team wins, and that's how it's going to be for Miranda at the time. So you already know. That's just my take on it. Um, overall, I enjoyed the Super Bowl. It was a great, fun watch. I watched it with my friends and family. We had a laugh. We, you know, it was exciting. It was on the HRC. We didn't know what was going to happen. And it was just a fresh new Super Bowl. I like it when new teams come have an opportunity to, you know, put a put a Lombardi, a Lombardi on their banner. Like, get a new trophy. Like, see new teams. Like, you know, upgrade to legacy. You know? Stuff like that. I'm um, sick and tired of seeing the same teams over and over and over again. I want to see something new, see something fresh, make it more exciting. And who get? we don't know who's going to win next year. So that's what makes the NFL so exciting and fun to watch moving forward. But that's what I think on the situation as regards to that. And that's just how it's going to be. But that's what I think. Um, again, congratulations to the Los Angeles Rams moving forward. All right, so let's get to some NBA news. So as we know, last week, a big mega trade had went down between this, the Brooklyn Nets and the Philadelphia 76ers. So obviously, the trade details as regards to that was Ben Simmons, uh, formerly of the 76ers, got traded to the Brooklyn Nets, and James Harden from the Brooklyn Nets got traded to the 76ers. And then there were further um, added details as regards to that which um, with pieces coming along with that. So Ben Simmons, Steph Curry, Andre Drummond, and two first round picks got we are being received from the Nets. And in return, the 76ers will receive James Harden and Paul Millsap as regards to the trade details. So 
people are asking themselves who won the trade, who lost the trade. And in my personal opinion, I think the Brooklyn Nets won the trade. Now, I know people are saying that 76ers won the trade because they got the, they got the all-star in Jace Harden. And they don't know what's going on with Ben Simmons. And there's going to be a lot of questions answered as regards to Kyrie Irving's uh, vaccination situation, Kevin Durant's injury, and etc. But if you look at it like this, the reason I say the Brooklyn Nets won the trade is because they have Ben Simmons, who's a great facilitator, great passer, great defender, great rebounder. Well, I'm not gonna say he's a great rebounder, but he's a good, he's a decent rebounder for his size. And he's gonna be able to facilitate the offense. Now, the sh what you lost in shooting and scoring from Jace Harden, Ben Simmons is gonna make up for that in defending. And what loss in shooting, you got that in Steph Curry. Steph Curry is gonna be able to space the floor and shoot the ball. And then you got back Andre Drummond that could, sh that could rebound and defend. And then you got first two two first round picks. Now, the, the two first round picks are not that much of of a factor because first time not gonna use them, probably could flip them and use that as a trade for to probably get something back. But I'm just saying, you got a lot. You got a decent haul for just getting rid of James Harden. And the 76ers, they also you can also say they got better too because they got a player that actually played for them and wants to play for them. James Harden and Embiid in the pick and roll is going to be dangerous. And then they have Paul Millsap to possibly come off the bench and utilize them however they want to utilize them. So it was a good trade for both teams. Both teams got better, but I just think that the Nets got the better end of the deal because. Once KD comes back healthy and Kyrie could play part time, once that team is fully locked and loaded, it's gonna be problems. Cause now you have Kyrie Irving at the point, and then you could have Ben Simmons at the two. Probably put Draymond. I mean, you could. I said Draymond. You could probably put KD at the three. You could slide Aldridge at the four, and you could put Drummond at the five, and then they could cause mismatch problems from there moving forward. And of course, you got all these, um, you know, pick and roll situations with Joel Embiid and James Harden. That's going to be a deadly combination. Um, Joel Embiid is probably going to have a, a great, efficient scorer and shooter that's going to help him space the floor. And he could do his magic inside. And he's been going off right now. He's leading the MVP race right now. So with James Harden, that's going to be big help for him because now he's going to have a facilitator and a scorer that's going to help space the floor for him. Moving forward. Now, my own, moving forward as regards to that trade issue, the next thing I want to get into is James Harden. And I'm going to wreck the coals over this kid right now because I feel like James Harden, overall as a player, he's a quitter. And I mean, I mean he's a huge quitter. Whenever things get hard, whenever the brights get too, like the lights get too bright, this guy runs away, he quits. Now, I'm not going to be like other sports media analysts and go over all the multiple times he shrank and went small, but I'm I'm predicting this right now that he's going to shrink in the playoffs. He's going to come up small. He's going to fold up in this upcoming playoffs because in a way, you like we understand when you when you left Okay, when you when you got traded from OKC, that was whatever because you tried to trade money, even though you did came out small in the 2012 finals with KD and Westbrook. Then you went on to Houston, doing great in Houston. Then you came up really small in not just one final series with the Houston Rockets, but you came up small in multiple series in the Houston Rockets. After that, you you went and got traded to the Brooklyn Nets. Now, I understand it was a difficult situation for you to deal with, with Kyrie being part-time, Kevin Durant getting hurt, etc. But still, this is this another this another time that you quit, and now you're on the Philadelphia 76ers, and it's like, what's next? What if this doesn't work out? Are you gonna quit again too? Where are you gonna go after this? People, people are sick and tired of James Harden and his foolishness because every time he pouts he's not in a particular perfect situation he wants to cry and whine complain eat get big and uh don't want to compete 
and that's why people don't respect him in the league. And now that they changed the rules, his number went down to the board, and he does it. He's not scoring at will like he used to, where he used to shoot 50 free throws and shoot 50 points, averaging 30, 40 points. That's not happening no more. The rules are changed, and now his play style is a little different. So he had to adjust to how he's playing now. A lot of players have had to adjust to how they're playing now because they're not getting the calls that they're used to getting calls. And that's good for the NBA because players like Chase Harden was ruining the sport. So now they made it better. So him, people like him got to adjust his play style so they don't get those BS calls and slow down the game. Nobody wants to watch Chase Harden shoot 15 free throws a game. That's, that's not pleased. That's not like a good, pleasing sight to watch, especially as an NBA fan. So I just don't like the way he conducts himself. I did the same thing with Ben Simmons. I don't. I didn't like the way he handled this situation. If he wanted, if he wanted to get traded, should have done. He should have requested trade, but continue playing. These players that's like under contract. I mean, like four year, five year contracts. You have to, to continue playing. You can't just pout, get mad, and not want to play just because you're not. You don't feel like you're in the right situation. Once your contract is finished, then you can leave it and you can go wherever you want to go. And then that's that. But for you to do that while on the contract is just cowardly on my part. And that's why I feel like James Hart is a quitter. He's been a quitter throughout his career, but I thought it was going to be different in Brooklyn. But it's more or less the same thing with James Harden. I don't believe him and Embiid are going to get it done. They're going to be a great team. They're going to be a great tandem. Um, they're gonna, I think they could possibly have a deep playoff run, but in terms of winning a championship, I just don't see it because James Harden is a quitter and he'll always be a quitter and he doesn't have what it takes to be an NBA champion or an NBA legend to be the one of the greatest small forward a shooting guards of all time. I don't see it. He doesn't have that makeup. He lacks intangibles. He lacks leadership. He lacks all that. Great basketball player, great skills player, but he just doesn't have what it takes to lead you to a championship. I may be wrong, but he's going to show me that I'm wrong in the playoffs when the lights are brightest and he's going to have to compete and win. Until then, I'm going to hold firm on what I think about James Harden overall as a player. He's a coward. Got no backbone, no guts, doesn't want to compete, nothing. Great player, but he's weak. He's, he comes up small multiple times in the clutch, and he doesn't want that spotlight. But again, that's just my opinion on the matter. So the next thing I wanted to get into was the Los Angeles Lakers and how they did not make any new moves in the before the trade deadline. So they're going to be keeping Russell Westbrook in path for the foreseeable future. I don't know how that's going to work. The team is a disaster right now. Um, I don't... I possibly don't see them making playoffs, but most likely, um, the, I feel like the NBA is going to help them make playoffs. Probably be an 8th or ninth, 10th seed. Being a, uh, the playing tournament, it's going to be exciting to see. It doesn't matter whether they're good or not, it's just having the Lakers in the playoffs is going to be good for rating. So you already know how the NBA is going to be with that. Um, they're going to pull some strings to try to uh, get LeBron Drake in because it's always going to be exciting just to see what type of haphazardness the Lakers could cause in the playing tournament if they win, then they could uh, face possibly the Warriors, the, the the Suns, the Utah Jazz, or the Memphis Grizzlies in the first round, and then see where they could go for them. I, I, get, I, I got them losing in five to all those teams that I just named. I don't care what nobody told me. They're losing in five. Don't matter the competition. I just don't see them as a good team, and then it's the fact that they still have Russ on their team. That's always going to be a recipe for disaster moving forward. Don't care about none of that because the team is old. They have a horrible point guard. They have an aging LeBron James, and they have a brittle AD. Frank Vogel most likely is going to get fired by the end of this season. Either during the season or he's going to get fired at the end of this season. I just don't see him keeping his job because this they gave him a pile of mess. To work with and most coaches are not going to be able to work with this because he's a great defensive head coach but he has no great pieces that can actually defend their position so you put him in between a rock and a hard place and that's never too good for a coach so most likely he's going to be scapegoated at the end of the season they're going to make some roster moves 
see what they could do about maybe moving Russell Westbrook and trying to get some pieces back, but I don't see what type of piece they could get that's going to help fit with LeBron James and AD moving forward. LeBron James is not getting any younger. He's going to be 38 in year 20. AD is going to be another year older. And I don't, of course, I'm not going to, I don't see him getting any healthy moving forward to play 82 games plus playoffs and be a heavy contributor for the Los Angeles Lakers. So it's looking bleak for the Lakers right now. And they don't have a draft pick till 2027. So they can't even take right now and try to get a top pick and flip it for something else. So who knows what, what the Lakers are going to do. Um, no LeBron is going to try to pull up something out of his sleeve. He's always done that before. I don't see anybody wanting to play with LeBron James because of the, his play style and the way that the media covers him. And you, you already see how Russ is being talked about throughout the media. So I don't see anybody else wanting to play with him and deal with the media backlash and scrutiny from his LeBron James fanboys such as Travis Sharp, Kyler Carhurd, and etc. So. Those are my thoughts on that matter, and let's move over to something else. Hey guys, welcome to the EO Speaks podcast on Anchor, where I talk about everything sports, such as NBA, NFL, UFC, etc., and give my perspective and opinions on the sports topics that interest me. I love talking about sports, debating with people on certain teams, players, news, and more while having a great dialogue doing so. So given my take on a matter that interests me. Make sure to follow me on Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and Twitch to get updates with my latest podcast when I drop. Stay tuned. Thank you and enjoy. All right, so in my next topic that I want to talk about is clearly the UFC. So, obviously, from Saturday night, we all know that Israel Adesanya beat uh, uh, for, uh, Bobby Knuckles in the championship match. It was a part two that, you know, people wanted to see. He was the next fighter up to face him. And when you watched the fight, it was just, it was just obvious that, you know, is he just put on a striking clinic? Bobby Knuckles, I respect for him. He did a decent job. Um, he came in with a different game plan. Um, I felt like he he tried some new style. He wasn't trying to strike back and forth with Izzy, which was a good idea. He was trying to take down Izzy, but that's not gonna happen. When it comes to Israel Adesanya, Israel Adesanya is either as big or bigger than the middleweights. So it's not going to be as easy to take him down. He has great takedown defense. When he went up to heavyweight and fa uh, faced John Blackwich, Blackwich was a lot more heavier than Israel Adesanya, so it made it more easier for him to take him down to the ground for one at the time when he defended his title. So that was a situation as regards to that. But in this one, where everyone's 185 pounds, same weight, soaking wet, and Israel is a little bit taller, He's gonna be able to stuff takedowns and stop um, stop the clutch, the, the grappling, etc. So again, I want to give all respects to Bobby Knuckles because he did a great job in his game plan. Um, it almost worked, but still, Israel Asana put on a striking clinic. He outstriked them in almost all the rounds. I don't really particularly see a round that Bobby Knuckles won, but who knows? Man? Maybe I'm being a little bit biased, but I don't think I'm not. I watched that fight really closely. Robert Whitaker, you know, did have some strike, good striking performance with it, but if he was able to take down Israel Estonia and hold him there and did a good number of damage on the ground for a particular amount of time, that probably would have swayed the judges in his favors. Yeah, he got some takedowns in, but Israel was able to get up from those takedowns with ease, which helped, you know, which didn't really help uh, Forrest Whitaker too much. So, eh, it wasn't too much for him. So, best of luck to him moving forward. So, now, Israel Adesanya. So, what's the next fight for Izzy? 
Um, fortunately, I did want to see him and John Jones have a fight, but that's clearly not going to happen since John Jones is moving up to heavyweight. And now that um, the, like, the light heavyweight division is like really back, it's broken open now since there's a new champion. But um, I don't see anybody that is he could face right now. It looks like he almost cleared up the division. There's possibly one more person that is he could fight. But still, he beat. He's beating everyone with ease. Like, come on, man. I don't, I don't know who is he could possibly face that he, that could win. And then they were kind of joking about, you know, is he facing Usman? But Usman and Izzy already agreed that they're not gonna face each other at all. So and that's not happening. Unfortunately, but that would be a great fight to see. But you already know how friends they're not gonna wanna face each other, especially if they train together, work out together, etc. So right now we all know based off the UFC rankings, Instagram out of Sunday is number one. And who else is who else is there? Robert Wicker is number two, Marvin Veltori is Number three, but I think Vontori is gonna be going against another fighter right now at the moment, so I don't see how that's gonna work. Uh, it like it looked like Israel on the start is gonna be chilling for a little bit, so I don't see him fighting some someone anytime soon. Yeah, so how strong right here is that. Uh, Gerard Cannon, Gerard Cannonier, he could be a possibly good candidate. I think he might be next in line to face Israel Adesanya. I know Derek Brunson and him just fought and Gerard Cannonier beat him. So that he could possibly be next in line. I know Derek Brunson is going to drop in the ranking since he lost. Paulo Costa, um, yeah, he's going to be fighting uh, Marvin Venturi. So whoever wins could possibly be next in line. Then there's Sean Strickland. He won, uh, moved up the division. John Henderson, he lost. And then there's Darren Till and Ural Hall. And Kevin Gasser's all the way at number 10. I don't see those guys winning at all. So, yeah, I think maybe most likely Gerard Cannonier is probably going to be next in line to face Israel Adesanya. I just don't know, just don't know when. It could be sometime this year or maybe next year, depending on what Israel want to do since he's a champion. And he's going to be defending his title for the foreseeable future moving forward. So now, speaking about that, I also wanted to speak about uh, John Jones and what he could possibly be doing in the heavyweight division. I've seen after the fight with Francis Ganao, um retaining his title, John Jones did hint it at a possible uh, contender fight uh, uh, like at the heavyweight division. So, I know that John Jones hasn't fought in like almost two years, but you know, it'll be a great for him to get a tune up fight at uh, the 205 division, possibly against Stipe Miotrys. He did make that uh, hit on Twitter. I think it'll be a great matchup with him. Stipe Miotrys versus John Jones, that'll be a fun fight to see. Um, I'll watch that fight contently to see how he adapts to moving up in weight, see if he could contend with the heavyweight division. Because I don't think John Jones should just go straight at Francis Ganon to like fight him for the title. I mean, I think he should get possibly two, three fights to see if he's like could contend for the title. But if he is able to contend for the title and beat those fighters and like get a championship contender fight. I already know the money got to be right with him because you already know how they did cheap with the money and paying their fighters. So, again, John Jones versus Stipe Miotrus will be a great fight. I don't know how Stipe would think about this, whether he want to take this fight or is he even trying to fight at all. I haven't seen him fight for like a whole year. I don't know if he's resting his body, taking a day off. But, yes, that's I think that's the next possible fight for him to make. And that would be a great fight to see moving forward to see if Stipe, if Stipe Miotrys is ready 
for a, uh, a part three uh, for that fight. Maybe, you know, do a trilogy fight because, you know, Stipe beat him the first time and Stipe had lost him the second time. So a possible trilogy fight with Francis Gano would be exciting to see. We don't, we don't get much trilogy fight as it is. So it, it's also, it's always a special moment occasion when we get those type of fights. Or maybe John Jones beat Stipe Miotrich and then we could get finally get that super fight that we wanted with John Jones versus Francis Gano and see who's the best and see who's who could beat who. Um, me personally, I, I have John Jones winning that fight, but who knows? Um, Francis Gano has been getting way more better as time gone forward. He's been better in striking. He's been better with his grappling. He's been better with his wrestling of all surprises. So that's great to see. He's been getting better at all facets of the game. He's being multi-dimensional. He's not focusing on one thing. He's not trying to get the home run knockout like he usually try to do. He's trying to win different type of ways, whether it's by knockout, TKO, uh, wrestling, uh, you know, decision, all that. That's it's great that he's growing as a fighter and getting better as a fighter because that shows growth in him and showing that he could win multiple ways because um, some fighters that are knockout artists, once they once they see that they can't knock out a particular fighter, they start to lose confidence, they start to lose heart in the fight, and that's not a way that you want to carry yourself as a fighter. You want to be multi-diverse and show that you can win in multiple styles. That's what the great fighters do. Now, there are certain fighters that win one particular way, but they're not going to last long once they run into a fighter that can stop what they can particularly do good. So it's best to be well diverse and that's why John Jones would be a great competition for Francis Gano because John Jones is a great strapper, great grappler, great striker and he has a, a great wrestling background so he's going to be trouble for Francis Gano and he's going to be trouble for anybody in the heavyweight division. I'm going to be excited to see that because we all want John Jones to be back regardless of his off the field issues. I don't care about that. We already know John Jones is not a saint. We know that. But in terms of being a UFC fighter, an MMA fighter, John Jones is one of the best to ever don the gloves. And I'm going to continue to watch his fight until he officially retires. And that's just me. So that's just my thoughts and opinions on the matter of all the things that I wanted to talk about in terms of sports. Let me know yours down in the comment section down below. What did you think about this Super Bowl? What did you think about, you know, Los Angeles Lakers? Did you think the Nets won a trade? Did you think the Sixers won a trade, etc.? And in regards to USC, did you watch the USC performance? Did you, did you not care? Did you do, what do you think about John Jones possibly facing first of the goal? Do you think that will be a uh, exciting matchup? Hey, tell me what you think. Do you agree? disagree with my takes let me know in the comments section down below if you're watching on youtube make sure to like subscribe on your way out this is Edo speaks out peace Coming in, yeah, flex, I just wanna win